Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Peter Kariva, and I'm the CEO and president of the aquarium. And this is, if you haven't been here before, this is our monthly first Wednesday. And just to give you a little insight into the um, routine here, so every first Wednesday of the month we have talks, almost always about either environmental issues or about animals. Uh, tonight it's about animals. And then afterwards, we'll have questions right after the talk. And, but then for those of you who want to stay, you, you exit out here at the bottom, and I'll remind you at the end. Um, and then there's cocktails and artwork and conversations, and there's an opportunity for you to, uh, to speak to the speaker more informally. I also wanted to draw attention to the sponsors for this, Courtyard by Marriott and, um, and the Olsons and their foundation. Well, tonight I think you're here because you want to learn about dolphins. Um, I think everybody wants to learn about dolphins to some extent. Um, you know, we often get asked, what, what, you know, we don't have dolphins here. That's a conscious decision. Um, like many aquaria, it's just given their intelligence, their behavior, and I think some of the things we'll learn today, it just doesn't feel right. But tonight's speaker is Dr. Hersink. She's the research director of the Wild Dolphin Project and she spent 38 years studying dolphins. So clearly she knows a lot about them, but we've been studying them in the wild. And um, she's got many accomplishments. I'll just mention a couple. One is a Guggenheim Fellowship, which is really hard to get. Um, and Dr. Herzink, please share your insights with us. All right, okay. I no, 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 I'm going to tell him. No. She just reminded me that I forgot to tell you that she was 28. By the way, I'm 16. <laughs> yeah, 38 years. Feels like a long time. Well, good evening. Thanks for coming. Uh, it's great to be at the aquarium. I came here today, uh, this, this afternoon. I played with your little uh, displays here and saw the aquarium. It's great. I'm from Florida, so I'm used to the heat. But I'm going to take you tonight uh, to the Bahamas, where I have been working for many, many decades now. Can you all hear me okay? I didn't think so. <laughs> hello, hello. There I am. There I am. All right. Woohoo! So you didn't miss anything. Hi, welcome. Um, so we're going to go to the Bahamas here. If we can whoop, start. Can I get mine on the screen here? Oh, technical, magical wizards. There we go. So anyway, tonight, so the way I thought I would start is I'm gonna tell you about the dolphins themselves, about their lives, et cetera, et cetera. And then I'm gonna tell you about major things we've learned and we're gonna talk a little bit about climate change and how that's actually uh, affecting the dolphins. So why do we study dolphins? Well, we know that they're complex and probably pretty intelligent. You know, for example, we know their brain to body ratio is second only to humans. So this is called the encephalization quotient. So they have uh, more complicated brains than even the great apes. They can use tools like a lot of animals can, but uh, we've learned that dolphins can use sponges to chase out poisonous fish on the bottom. Uh, we know from captive studies that they can understand artificial languages. We don't know that they have a language, but we know they have the flexibility to understand languages. And they can recognize themselves in the mirror, which is basically um, evidence of self-awareness. Now, most of our work is observation and decoding, and we work under the water. We're lucky to work in the Bahamas where you can uh, see underwater. And most places you would see two dolphins jumping out of the water like this, and actually they'd be fighting underneath or not playing. So underwater is really important. Our major tool that I've used for decades is underwater video camera with sound, with a hydrophone that records sound. And we work pretty non-invasively. We just observe for the most part. And over uh, the years, we have about 300 individuals, and we're on our fourth generation, which is really exciting. Now, uh, this is the United States. Here's, uh, here's Miami over here. Um, so we work in the northern Bahamas, and the Bahamas is an archipelago nation. So it consists of a lot of islands with submerged land that's very shallow. So LBB is called Little Bahama Bank. GBB is called Great Bahama Bank. And these are the two uh, northernmost islands that we're going to be talking about. Now we uh, work on a 62-foot uh, catamaran. We got amazingly donated in 1992. 
Um, it's a liveaboard, so we go out for 10 days at a time. We go to where the dolphins are. We eat, sleep, study on the boat. And we're out for about four to five months every summer since 1985. And yes, it's hurricane season. Um, but believe it or not, it's the calmest time just because of the direction of the wind. So weather is one of our major factors, of course, as well as finding the dolphins. Now, we work with Atlantic spotted dolphins, Stanella frontalis, and they're really nice to work with because the calves have no spots. They kind of look like a young bottlenose. The mothers have spots. This is Muggsy. She's 35 years old in this spot, uh, picture. And we identify their nicks and notches in their dorsal fin, but because they're spotted, we also track their spots like uh, constellations. So we go out every year, we identify them and catch up with their spots every year. So they're a really nice species to work with that way. Um, they have really clear uh, color phases and age uh, developmental phases. So this is one individual through her life. This is La Lava. This is at age three, and she's a, still a calf. We call her two-toned. And this is Lava at age six, and she's starting to get a few uh, dark spots. I'm not sure how well you can see that, but dark spots on the ventral side. She's a teenager, and we call her Speckled. Then this is Lava at age 12. She's got a lot more spots. We consider her a young adult at this age. We call her modeled. And this is the age where females will uh, become sexually mature and uh, start getting pregnant and having their calves. And then here's old Lava at age 15. Uh, she's an old adult. We call them fused. Um, but they can live into their 50s, at least from what we've seen out in the wild. And this is the age when the males become uh, sexually mature. So the males mature a bit later than the females. There's a joke there somewhere. <laughs> Another advantage of working underwater is we can sex the animals because all their organs are internal. They're hydrodynamic. And again, because they're mammals, of course, the females have mammary slits uh, where the young will nurse. So mothers and calves, uh, the calves will stay with the mothers around three years or so. They nurse during that time, and they'll gradually be weaned. But we have about a 25% mortality in the first year due to just natural causes for the most part. Um, and the one big thing we've learned over the decades is that females associate by reproductive status. So, uh, for example, two females, Rose Mole and Little Gash, I met as juveniles in 1985, and they hung out together, and Rose Mole started dating first, and she got pregnant, and Little Gash sort of hung out with other dolphins until she also matured and got pregnant, and then they had their two little calves, Rosebud and Little Haley, and then they all started associating together. So for females, they hang out with their other females probably for foraging reasons, safety when they're pregnant. And now juveniles, teenagers, and yes, they are teenagers, they get in trouble. Um, this is the time when they move away from their mothers and they form little gangs. And uh, they learn how to play, how to harass fish, how to harass each other. It's a vulnerable time for them because they're kind of away from uh, the normal protection they're used to. But this is the time when they really develop their social skills and they learned how to become uh, adult dolphins. So this is a very pregnant dolphin, uh, Katie. Hopefully you can see her belly. This is my video camera here. And her mother was blotches. Uh, so I met Katie in 1986. Then when she was finally reproductive age, she had a uh, Kai born in 2000. That was our first uh, third generation dolphin. And this is a family tree now of an example of a fourth generation. So uh, Paint was a, a female I met. She had Brush among other calves. And then Brush uh, had uh, a lot of different calves. And out of these, Burgundy has produced now two fourth generation dolphins. So this is literally how we track their lines, um, uh, including uh, some genetic work as well. The second big thing we've learned is that males are lifelong friends. So they form alliances. Uh, they start really in their juvenile years, actually. They'll kind of test each other out. And next to the uh, females, they have the tightest uh, bonding in the whole society. So they're lifelong buddies unless one dies or has some big event. 
Now, we do collect DNA. Like I said, we're pretty non-invasive. So we collect DNA by gathering their fecal material in the water uh, to do paternity tests, basically. Um, this is one of my graduate students who's scooping poop, basically. And uh, we call them the femme fecales. Ooh, that's bad, huh? Um, and the, the interesting point is older males are the ones that sire most of the offspring. So you guys out there, if you're older, there you go. Um, anyway, it's important to know if you want to understand the mating systems and structure. So older males have the most experience, and the young guys are usually just showing off, perhaps. Um, this is some really cool video. It's a little old, so it's not great uh, resolution, but I wanted to show it to you because it's a really good example of courtship and mating. So this is little Gash with her small calf underneath her. And he's about two years old. And the males are going to be the ones that are upside down. And they're trying to get underneath the female to get access to mate with her. And they're kind of stacked up to get access. And the calf is kind of in the way. It's just... But they'll, they'll They'll go down, they'll, they'll expel air, they'll, they'll sink to the bottom, then they'll come back up again and try to get underneath her. But what's really interesting to me about this video is that the calf is there. He's hearing, seeing, you know, feeling everything that's going on. So they're getting experience with the whole routine, even at this young age. Um, now, if the mother's not interested in these males, she can actually tail slap them away and, you know. So uh, females do have some choice, and there's a lot of interesting discussion in that later if you want to talk to me. Um, so one of the really interesting things I didn't really expect to see when I went out there was um, how often uh, the two species, because there's also bottlenose dolphins out where we work, how much these two species interacted. So the bottlenose are about three feet larger than the spotted, so there's a big old bottlenose there and surrounded by these cute little elfish spotted dolphins. And we do study them. We try to uh, do photo ID as well and uh, track their behavior, but that they're a little less tolerant of us in the water. But they do really cool things together. Sometimes they, we see them foraging together. There's a bottlenose way in the back. They're foraging with this group of spotteds in the sand. Um, we see interspecies babysitting, where the female spotteds will grab a bottlenose calf and, and sort of take them to play. Uh, we see male dominance between the species. A male a bottlenose will uh, copulate and mount the male spotteds. And we think it's kind of a, well, it's a long-term relationship thing, but it's a dominance behavior. Um, we also see interspecies alliances. So we might see the two groups fighting, bottlenose and, and spotted males fighting, and then a big shark comes in the area, and they'll stop fighting and join forces and chase the shark away. So they really know each other as neighbors in a very intimate way. And we have seen what we think are hybrids, and we're looking at that uh, genetically as well. Now, um, everybody knows dolphins and that they have really great acoustics, right? They're great acousticians. Uh, they produce and hear sounds well above our hearing. But they have good vision, especially in tropical waters. And they have the cross-modal abilities between these two senses, like we have between vision and touch. Dolphins have between sound and vision. They have a taste, which is a chemical sense. They do not have smell. And touch is very important to dolphins, as, you, as you've seen, I'm sure. And sound can be used as touch to dolphins um, because the acoustic uh, impedance of their, their skin is such that that sound will go right through it till it hits air or bone. So they could like tickle each other from a distance or maybe even you know, hurt each other at a distance, who knows. But anyway, um, so they can buzz each other a long way. Now we do know some things. We know that dolphins uh, make whistles, sometimes signature whistles, which are basically names. And they make a sound called burst pulse uh, sounds. This is used for aggression and uh, their close proximity sounds. And those were not ducks, those were dolphins. Um, they have their echolocation clicks, which is their sonar. They use for foraging, <laughs> navigation. And they also, if they take those clicks and pack them together really tight, they make buzzes. And these are 
uh, really intense buzzes they use during courtship, discipline, and sometimes when they're chasing sharks, for example. So we know some of these basic categories of sounds and what, be what behavioral context you might uh, see them in. They also uh, synchronize their vocalizations. And this happens when yeah, a bunch of dolphins are chasing one dolphin. Um, synchrony is very important to dolphins, breathing as well as uh, making vocalizations. Now, this is really cool footage. I really wanted to show you. These are bottlenose dolphins. And what you're going to see and hear, you're going to see two dyads of dolphins sort of pointing at each other, coordinating their sounds, breaking apart, pointing at each other, breaking apart. It's really unique footage. I've, I've never seen it since this uh, event, but it's, it's pretty neat. What are they saying? So we, we, we aren't sure, but we think they're two sets of male dolphins probably competing or trying to coordinate, show up. Anyway, if you've got any ideas, let me know. So the Little Bahama Bank, these sand banks are really great for dolphins because they can feed in the safe, shallow waters during the daytime on fish. And at night, they go to these nocturnal uh, edges that drop off really quickly into the Gulf Stream and feed along the deep water edge. Um, so it makes it safe for a researcher to work for the most part, but it's also part of the reason these dolphins are resident year-round, as far as we know, because um, they have adequate food. Now, um, so kind of a busy slide, but uh, one of my graduate students started looking at the species that the dolphins were eating. And the spotted and bottlenose, they have quite a variety, maybe 14 or 15 species that we've seen them eat. Um, uh, the bottlenose tend to dig in kind of deeper waters. They'll go after deep eels because they're really fatty and big. The spotteds like their little flounders and, and razorfish right under the surface. But they have quite a diverse diet, which is nice. And the other thing we've seen with teaching, again, a graduate student of mine, Courtney Bender, did a really neat study. Um, because, you know, you wonder, how do, how do dolphins learn, right? Do they just watch and trial and error? And she looked at the, um, the length of time uh, so the mother's length of time that they spend trying to grab a fish is this lower line. These are just individual dolphins here. And these lines are the time that the mother spends while with, when with a calf trying to catch a fish. And so clearly they're spending time showing them, engaging them, maybe chasing the fish and letting the calf go at it. So it's a pretty clear example of uh, teaching in mammals, which is pretty neat. And like I said, they go off this deep water edge. They'll go after flying fish and squid. This is in about 800 to 1,000 feet of water. Um, and that's a really cool time to see them feed. And flying fish are very um, fatty fish, so very calorically important. Squid are kind of watery, so the, like the females tend to eat a lot of those because uh, they're lactating. Now, dolphins have their challenges, um, natural challenges as well. And for an example, so the pink star is our study site, the coast of Florida, obviously. And uh, this is one of the hurricanes. In 2004, we had hurricanes Francis and Jean with come within three weeks of each other, both over our study site. And uh, Hurricane Francis was uh, very specifically um, destructive because it hovered over our study site for like 36 hours, which is really hard if you can imagine being a mammal breathing air and not being able to breathe there. Um, then in 2005, we had Hurricane Wilma also go over our study site. And after we assessed uh, the dolphins, we had lost 30% of both species. 
um, which was really shocking, you know, to lose 30% of, you know, we would have a group of 100 animals any given year, right? So 30%, it's huge. And it really destabilized their social behavior. That's what was also really uh, striking to me is that they were just discombobulated. They didn't know who to hang out with. You know, there was a couple animals, but then the other, their other friends were gone. And so it really took about, gosh, about four or five years before they kind of settled down and um, started reproducing again, et cetera, et cetera. So hurricanes are a challenge, whether they're uh, driven by uh, climate change for more intensity or just historically, um, they're a problem. Now, the other thing that we've seen uh, fairly recently is in 2013, um, we noticed some big changes. So historically, we've had three clusters of dolphins in this area on a little Bahama bank, a southern group, a northern group, and a central group. And kind of before 2013, we had kind of anecdotally noticed that the prey was not there. Like we'd go drifting at night trying to see, watch the dolphins feed, and they're like, where are the flying fish? Where are the squid? Well, it turns out that the central group, which is about 52 animals, just moved um, across the deep water to this next bank, uh, Great Bahama Bank. And it's a place where there are already local dolphins. So now there are uh, two groups trying to interact. And we've been monitoring that, actually. And it's, uh, we finally have the data that shows that they're integrated now with each other. So it's kind of a natural experiment in some ways. Um, but what would make a group of stable resident dolphins move? After decades, you know, probably more than I've been out there, what would make them move? So we started looking at possibilities. Well, were there orcas around? Was the Navy blasting uh, sonar? You know, we looked at all those things. And then we started looking, we thought we well, better look at the oceanographic features and see what we could find. So we accessed a, a database from NOAA called COPAPOD. You can read the acronym there. Um, but it basically used satellite imagery uh, to gather data. So what we did is we said, okay, let's look at Little Bahama Bank, and in the red uh, box, that's the area we set out to analyze. And then we said, well, let's look offshore too. So we took a sample of data from offshore in Little Bahama Bank. And then we did the same thing with Great Bahama Bank. We said, okay, here's uh, data from the sand bank, and here's data from offshore. And what we found, was really um, pretty significant. We found that on Little Bahama Bank, on the shallow sand banks where the dolphins would feed and rest during the day, the uh, chlorophyll had dropped significantly. And uh, chlorophyll is a proxy for plankton, right? So the food chain. So the best, our best guess is that literally they had a food crash and they could no longer sustain uh, the whole group there. And so they moved on to greener pastures, as we say. Um, the NOAA data set also had showed significant increase in wind speed in the, the whole Bahamas, really. Um, and we had noticed a change in direction of wind. So whatever was happening was really destroying the food chain, decreasing productivity. We don't know really what would decrease chlorophyll. You know, it's either sunlight or nutrients. Well, the Bahamas has plenty of sunlight, right? So somehow, perhaps, the nutrient cycle was disrupted. So that's, that's one challenge the dolphins have had, and it's a major, major uh, challenge to be displaced from your home and then to move in an, an area where you have other dolphins as well. Um, but there are a lot of tools we all use, um, and we keep adding toys to our uh, closet. Um, one of the things we started doing in 2018 was using passive acoustic monitoring. This is a technique that's used all over the world for uh, basically recording sounds underwater 24-7, and then re gathering the data and then taking a look at it. So we set up a system, ours were called EARS, they're sound traps and other uh, devices now. And basically we put them on the bottom for a couple of months, we pick them back up, and it's basically a, um, a long tube with computer, hydrophone, and a big battery to last the duration. And, and in our case, we deployed it one summer, we thought, well, maybe this would help us find our lost dolphins because you know, we had lost half of our dolphins on Little Bahama Bank, and like, now we have to find the others. You know, it's a, it's a big ocean, as I always say. So anyway, long story short, when we finally got the data, we actually could see certain tidal cycles where uh, we had recorded the whistles of the spotted dolphins. 
And so we set up our surveys to try to go there during those time periods, and voila, there the dolphins were. So it's a great tool for um, you know, detecting species, detecting activity, all those things we do. Um, I wanted to also share a really cool story. Uh, this is the Lambda story about a dolphin that was uh, stranded, uh, rescued, rehabbed, and released. So here's little Lambda. He is a male from our group, and he live stranded on a beach uh, about 100 kilometers away from his, literally his home. And this is on Great Bahama Bank. So this is his home, Bimini. He stranded over here in the Berry Islands. He was flown to Nassau and rehabilitated for three months, and then he was flown back to Bimini. And we were involved in that process, and, and although we don't usually uh, tag animals because we don't handle them, uh, he was out of the water, so we did uh, manage to put a satellite tag on him. And as soon as we put him back in the water, he just took off. These, all these dots recommend his movements down. This is the edge of the sand bank, all you know, shallow water, deep water. And he went 120 miles the first day, then the next day he went 120 miles. This is Cuba. So we're like, hey, habla espanol? <laughs> Maybe we could decode you. Um, so the guy really just trucked on down here. He hung out here for a month. And you know, now be reminded, we don't know if he's with other dolphins or he's by himself or he goes there occasionally for vacation. I don't know. But, Anyway, so he hung out here, and then he finally came back after about four months back to his local group. And, and we were able to see him again, and I can report that he's happy-go-lucky and probably reproducing as we're speaking. Um, but it was a neat story because, you know, satellite tags, of course, are great technology. We don't use them because we don't want to handle our animals and not be able to see them underwater again. But it really gives you a bigger picture, you know, that you wouldn't normally see of, of where your animals go, for example. Um, of course, drones, everybody's using drones now, we know that. Uh, very specifically in the marine mammal field, people are using drones for whales, for dolphins, for health assessments from the air, for looking at behavior. Great technology, bird's eye view, never had it before. So lots of cool things going on with drones, a good example of another uh, technology. But the question remains, what are these dolphins thinking, right? So, so with all this data, and, and my basic interest is looking at their communication system and how do you get at what they're thinking and what they're maybe sharing as far as information. So this is a bunch of fighting dolphins. It's kind of low-level aggression, I would call it. Kind of like head to head, a little open mouth, they're squawking at each other. So, how do you even begin to look at that, you know, if you want to figure out what they're saying to each other? So, first problem is that they use high frequency sounds, so you have to be recording their ultrasounds. So, here you see uh, a spectrogram over in this left-hand uh, lower corner here. Those are the kinds of sounds you've been hearing, the little whistles I've been playing in the narrow band. Uh, this sound is uh, collected up to about 110 kilohertz way above our hearing. And one of the things you start noticing is, oh, they produce harmonics with their whistles. And harmonics actually have, we think, very specific um, functions for dolphins for uh, locating each other. And you'll also notice that if you were only looking in the uh, human audible range, you wouldn't even know that there was any sound here because this is human audible, but yet here's a clicks, bunch of clicks that go way up into the high frequencies. So recording high frequency is really critical if you want to study dolphin communication. The second thing is localizing the vocalizer. How do you know who's making a sound? Right, so um, we've been working with a colleague from Singapore for quite a few years now to uh, help develop, and well, we call it ASPOD. You have to be careful how you pronounce that, but it's ASPOD. So, and the, and the idea is that uh, you can localize a dolphin sound if you triangulate, if you have more than one hydrophone, and, and uh, terrestrial researchers do this all the time with multiple microphones, right? So you can. Um, triangulate which dolphin is making sound. And the idea is he's recording video, he's uh, recording sound at the same time, and, and the program is 
coordinating it. And when you process the information, this is what you get. You get now the video image overlaid with information on who's making what sound. These are two bottlenose. The red squares basically um, mean that they're echolocating. Um, you can't see this very well down here. But this is the spectrogram. This is actually a waveform. Uh, sorry, you'll see the next one. Anyway, so this tells you that, hey, those two dolphins are at the same time echolocating. Here's another example. Here's a group of spotteds now. And the yellow stars are whistles or um, burst pulse sounds. We're trying to figure that out with the data. But so you've got head-to-head -head activity with some spotteds that's showing, oh, they're both little squawking at each other. And here's some guys that are echolocating. So now you can start looking at dolphin-to-dolphin -dolphin conversation and seeing who's making what sound when and maybe uh, analyzing that in some significant way if you want to look at a dolphin conversation. And another big thing left in the animal world is uh, what kind of communication. Do, do animals have referential communication or graded communication? So referential really refers to uh, uh, something, sounds that refer to something like labels, like names, you know, or words. I'm speaking words. A graded uh, system is a system that um, really shows you the motivation or emotional output of an animal. So now we have both, right? I can wave my arms and be excited about something, but I'm also speaking words. So right now we know that um, dolphin signature whistles are considered referential because um, they label names, they label specific individuals. And burst pulses, we think, maybe are a little more showing the motivation or intention for animals to act. Now we know um, vervet monkeys, for decades, we've known that they make different alarm calls for different predators. Those are labels. Um, Names for different predators. Prairie dogs do the same thing. They have alarm calls that encode specific information. And like I said, dolphin signature whistles are considered a referential signal or a word in their communication system. And you can, you can imagine it could be pretty useful to describe to your calves that it's a hammerhead shark versus a tiger shark or a bull shark, right? That would be a natural thing to potentially label in the communication system. So do they have language? Do they have language-like structures? Well, these are little, I don't know, prairie dogs. Oh, that's very quiet. You can't hear that. Anyway, these are spectrograms. Of Those are the duck dolphins again. Um, so you can see how structurally these spectrograms kind of look similar, right? Humans' words, that's what it looks like on the top there. Prairie dogs, and these are dolphins. So how do we know if they have something like language? Well, there are a lot of different methods we've used over the decades to decode things. The first is just visual. Here are four different signature whistles. You can see how different they look. And sometimes we just let uh, people decide. There are neural nets. Um, if you take a red whistle and a green whistle and throw it into a computer representing two different individuals, the computer can either separate them nicely, like the second example, um, or it cannot. So we get a quantitative measure of how uh, different whistles are. Uh, some researchers have used information theory, which just basically it's mathematical uh, setup to show you how complex a system is. But if you really want to look at language, you have to start looking at do different units combine? Do they recombine? So most of the time, we've looked at whistles as one unit. But is it possible that there are smallest units that recombine, like human phonemes do, for example? Um, one of the things we're learning uh, through our machine learning is, is the kind of the categories of sounds that are hard for us to uh, categorize, for example. Um, so the computer will help us mine our data, label sounds that are difficult, and then show us on the spectrogram uh, what comes after what. So A comes after, L comes after A and E, et cetera. So we start looking at sequences and how they recombine. And then sort of the grand finale really is to look at sequences, or to look for grammar. Um, so this is an example. This is actually from our data. And it, what it's showing you here is it's showing you a real sequence that we found. Um, and it basically reads, sound A is followed by B or C, followed by A, followed by kind of anything, followed by A, et cetera, et cetera. So once you start finding grammar in order, it might suggest 
language. And I know everybody's kind of scared of AI these days, but these are the kind of things that actually the computers can um, help us do, which is great. Um, the last thing I just want to share is, is how we're trying to explore animal minds in a different way. So we all know the great cognitive work probably by Irene Pepperberg, working with uh, her birds, Alex. And uh, birds can mimic human words often, so she didn't need any great machinery. But um, when you work with animals that have different sensory systems, uh, like uh, bonobo chimps there on the left with Sue Savage Rumba, using a keyboard, or dolphins working with a human at this big keyboard that used to be at Epcot Center at Walt Disney World, you need to create technological interfaces if you want to bridge the gap in communication. So if you want to look at mutually communicating versus just observing, you need some toys. Um, so we've been working with a, a group at uh, Georgia Tech in Atlanta. This is a system called CHAT, Cetacean Hearing Augmentation System and um, art technology, sorry. And basically it's a big box. It's, it's got a video camera, a keyboard, uh, a speaker that puts out sound, hydrophones that receive sound. And the idea is that um, it's an interactive acoustic system, so you're kind of like a dolphin swimming around in the water. Uh, there's no keyboard, but it's just all acoustic. Uh, the divers wear boxes. They operate a, a, a keypad with preloaded sounds that label toys that the dolphins like. Uh, we have headsets on so we can hear what's going on. And in theory, the computer does real-time recognition if the dolphins do any mimics so we can um, tell what's going on. And in the water, we use a, a model rivalry system, which is actually what Pepperberg used with her parrots, and the idea is that you're just um, competing for attention. Uh, two researchers, well, this is what it would look like. Um, sorry, jumping ahead here. Um, this is our new streamline unit, just to show you where we are right now. Um, we have an armband now to play sounds, and we have a little smartphone now. Phones have gotten so good now, we can actually do our computer processing on smartphones. But the idea is that Diver A and Diver B have a system on and they're playing a sargassum whistle, which uh, the dolphin hears as a whistle that they are uh, able to mimic if they want to. And if they do, Diver A and Diver B both hear that whistle from the dolphins and they can give the dolphin the object they want. So um, it's a pretty cool system. It's very simple, but the idea is, you know, is it a potential system to use for a mutual communication system? And just lastly, I just wanted to show you a couple ways uh, the dolphins have responded to this. So on the left, you see, um, this is actually the computer sound for scarf, an object we take in the water when they like to play. This is a signature whistle. So they often responded using their signature whistle, maybe because they thought the whistle was our signature whistle, and that's how they work with each other. Um, but they tried a lot of different things to mimic. Um, this is also computer sound here for uh, sargassum. And this little, little upsweep here is what the dolphins kind of added on, uh, which is pretty cool. So we've been getting some interesting data. Uh, we're not talking to anybody yet, but um, it's a pretty cool system to try to enter their world and uh, do what they do with sounds. And just some closing thoughts, you know, um, everybody knows how bad the environment is and all these degrading environments. And even though dolphins are mobile, they still will have to adjust their, um, their movement, their habitats, and you know, it's gonna stress a lot of systems out. And it's really important uh, to have baseline data to do long-term monitoring, because you know, like in our case, we would have never noticed they were Dolphins moved. We didn't know who they were. We didn't see them every summer. So we use everything in our arsenal we can to uh, keep on top of that. And yes, artificial intelligence, including machine learning and other things, can be used in a lot of different ways, certainly with language stuff um, we just looked at. But I'm sure there'll be all sorts of new ways that will emerge. And that's it. Thank you. I guess we have questions. There'll be a little elves, elves in the audience running around with microphones. There we go.
Thank you very much. You are my new favorite person. <laughs> um, that was fascinating. Um, two questions, if possible. Um, one is, they must recognize you after all this time. What, um, if any, and I know you have passive observation, but what, if any, kind of interaction do they display with you? Oh, well, I mean, they do all sorts of things. A typical scenario would be uh, you'd get in the water, and if you know the individual dolphin, they'd come towards you, they'd swim in circles, whistle, make their signature whistle. Um, you know, we talk to them, we're like, hi, how are you doing? You know, we do little cute sounds through our snorkel, you know, because they're interactive. I mean, part of it is just observation decoding, but we want them to be habituated and comfortable with us in the water so they can start their own behavior. Um, yeah, and they recognize regular people that are out there for sure. And our boat, they love our boat because they have two hulls to bow right on and there's no waiting, so that's good. Yeah. Right. And the second question, um, according to the internet, there is a researcher um, off of Florida studying reef shark and she um, removed a, a hook from one of the shark's mouths and then this, uh, from her study group, and the, um, following that, then other sharks came in mm -hmm. and um, had hooks that they, um, she has now removed something like 400 hooks. It, and it's the internet. Um, I don't know if that, I don't know if you're familiar with that, if that's true, but any thoughts on if that is true, what kind of communication is going on there? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's very true, and it's very true for a lot of different animals. Manta rays are doing the same thing off of Florida. There are whales that will go up to divers sometimes and, you know, let them take off nets and then seem to show them a thank you. I mean, you can say it's anthropomorphic, but animals are very aware, as many of you know, of what's going on, you know, individuals. And if, if, I guess if they've learned they can go to a human for help versus, you know, not help, that they might try. But there were other sharks from right. outside the egg, and it was being communicated somehow. Yeah, I don't know how the sharks would communicate it. Maybe they just verbally wa or, or, or watched it visually, you know, um, I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. I do not know how that would pass information with sharks. I'm, I'm not quite clear on how many vocalizations they might have, but, um, but you know, yeah, we'll find out eventually, hopefully. Hi there. My question has to do with reproduction, and the first part is, um, in dolphin, is there a similar type of XY chromosome type of thing and leading into that, is there any um, imbalance or is there a 50-50 balance in reproduction of males to females? And is the male or female more genetically responsible for that? Uh, well, big question. Uh, yeah, they have XY, they're mammals, right? And they have chromosomes, you know, the whole setup like mammals do. Um, if you look at the structure, at least our dolphins, uh, it's pretty half and half, 50% females, 50% males. But then as they go through their life phases, um, males might be, you know, might die off quicker than some of the females. So there's a change in parity there throughout their life phases, et cetera, et cetera. And females um, do not go into menopause. There are some uh, whale species that do now, we know. Um, orcas and pilot whales and um, but so they only live to about 40 and these really slow down the reproduction live to about 40 the males actually can live into their 50s um, yeah so that's kind of what we know thank you and it's it's probably similar in a lot of small dolphin species would be my estimate Great presentation. I, I was thinking about the triangulation gear that your divers have. How do the dolphins tell who's speaking? Well, they can triangulate. So, so they have two ears. You know, they're, they're you know, inner ears only. They don't have the external. They receive air, uh, sound through their lower jaw, and they uh, receive it in a time differential, right? So if sound is different than here, they can locate that way. So they already have a triangulation system. Okay, so they just have two and not three. 
Uh, yes, that's correct. Right. How do you fly the dolphins? You said that you flew a dolphin from one location to another. How does that work? How do you fly a dolphin? You said you flew the dolphin. Put little wings. <laughs> I, do you have some no. aircraft? With it's great footage. I, 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 I wish I had a link with me, but if you go to the link, there's a link on the Atlantis. Uh, it has a marine rescue center in Nassau, Bahamas. And they have a, a cool little video they put together with you know, all of us. But, so this little guy's being flown in a, pl in a seaplane Right? So he's on there, he's got a little towel over him to keep him moist. And the coolest footage is when they're rehabbing him at the center, he's got a little yellow life vest on to float because he was paralyzed his whole back end. He couldn't float or swim. So that's why he probably live stranded, he was going to drown, right? And so they're like exercising him like you would, you know, a human or a dog in a pool. He's like in his little life jacket. It's really cute. <laughs> and then they put him in another seaplane and they flew him to the Bahamas. Uh, to Bimini, and we were there trying to find the big group so we could drop them in with the big group. And they put him in a small boat and drove him out to us, and then we dumped him in the water. So yeah, he's had quite a few flights. He's got some air miles. Hi, so you had mentioned the effects of hurricanes and other um, food web crashes. What are some effects of noise pollution on dolphins, and is, are there trends of us reducing that, or is it growing? Well, yeah, noise pollution in all the oceans are huge, of course. We all make noise, small boats, big boats, cargo ships. Um, yeah, sometimes they can actually um, destroy part of their inner hair cells in their ears so they can change the frequencies, you know, like we would lose our hearing at certain ranges. Um, there are some things happening. Um, one of the things that they're trying to do is simply also just because of um, running into whales if you're a cargo ship, changing the shipping channels just enough to be away from a, a whale migratory route, for example, um, so they can move along freely and probably reduce the noise. Now, I don't know that the word's completely in on the uh, total impact, depends on the species and the proximity to the ships, but um, it definitely has an impact for sure. Um, how much of the time are you using scuba gear or, or just tree diving uh, with these dolphins? So we primarily snorkel and free dive for our work. The only time we really use scuba gear is to put instrumentation down on the bottom or for something other kind of project. So yeah, we're just free diving really. Yeah, I'm, you might. How do you uh, attach the tracker to the dolphins? How do you attach the satellite tag? The to tracker. The, the tracker? Yeah, so it's, uh, you actually have to drill a hole through their dorsal fin. Yeah, they don't have huge feeling there, but there, it's cartilage, but there are some blood vessels. Yeah, I mean, well, originally radio tags, gosh, when those were being developed, they were like going through the blubber in large whales and then <laughs> attaching like that. Um, you know, a large whale's not going to feel a satellite tag these days, but small dolphin, that's about as small as the transmitters get, actually, for um, dolphins. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's done by a vet, you know, it's monitored, and the uh, tag is designed to fall off after a certain time. And people track these things, like, is it healing, or are they okay? So pretty, pretty much they're okay, but like I said, we don't handle our animals. We don't want to grab them, take them out of the water, put a tag on it. You know, it's just we work under the water with them. Um, but it's, it's a valuable tool, but yeah, I know. Well, now I have to say, though, there are, um, there are some alternatives now. There are suction cup tags um, that you can shoot with a crossbow. It's like a, you know, just sucks onto the dolphin, and it might hold for a day or two, but they're not long-term tags. But that is something that... Uh, research are use, using more and more for short-term monitoring. Do they, mate, do they mate for life or do they have a lot of mates like humans? <laughs> <laughs> Should I tell her or not? <laughs> no, they are, they are definitely not uh, monogamous. They're very promiscuous. Um, yeah, it's just their social system. 
But you know, when you think of it, it's kind of cool because you know the males don't know who the father is either, so they have to, have to take care of everybody. So, <laughs> I like that answer. Hi, Denise. Thank you very much. It was a great presentation. Um, I have probably a little more rudimentary question. You had a really neat sequence of lava and the life stages. I think it was lava um, from calf to adult. How do you identify the calf? Because I know once you get you get spots or maybe nicks that you can start to track the the animal over its life. But when it's a calf, how? I mean, now that you've been there for decades, I'm sure that helps. But just wondering how you recognize them at that young age. Yeah. So if you ask my research assistants, they'll grumble. Um, calves are really hard, like because you said they don't have a lot of marks. Here I'm looking for. Um, there we go. So. Um, we use anything we can get. And for example, a young animal might have this, can we turn the lights down just a little bit if possible? So they have, th this is a dark throat mark on an animal, right? So you might have throat marks before they get spots, right? You also have sometimes their eyes have kind of distinct uh, lines around them. So we use anything we can get, honestly. Now the calves are with the mothers for the most Part, right, and we identify them nursing, so we try to get a handle on it before they leave their mothers. But yeah, oh, it's, it's a detective job, for sure. Like, for example, this summer, I can tell you, there were these two new calves, and they showed up, but nobody was sure who they belonged to, because they were zipping around, saying hi to everybody, and it's until you see them nursing. So you have to have enough field time to see them over and over and over again to determine who they belong to. And then genetics, of course. But yeah, no, they're difficult when they're young, thank you. Quick question for you, or two. Uh, is the slide deck available on the website? Uh, no. Would you like it to be? <laughs> and then uh, you'd mentioned, I think, 30% were lost during the hurricane. Can you expand on what lost is? Is that they died, they were just disappeared? So in our case, we don't really see them die. We've never seen a dead dolphin. We've seen sick dolphins in our group. 30% uh, were gone. Right, 30% of both species. Now, some of my colleagues have said, oh, they probably just moved down island or something. But, um, you know, they, they, they left their group. You know, you'd have a family group and there'd be like one missing. And like if they were around, they'd be there, right? At least that's my thought. Now, it's possible they got lost, I guess. A dolphin could get lost, I'm sure, like any other animal. Um, but they were never seen again. So we consider that lost, probably deceased. We give, we give our dolphins about three years before we consider them lost. Like maybe one year we just didn't see that animal. They were, you know, outside of our viewing range for some reason. But yeah, so as far as I know, they were gone. Time for one more question. I enjoyed your presentation immensely. I was going to ask about the 30% that didn't survive during the hurricane. And has there been studies on the effect of maybe separation anxiety or effect on their health when they might be separated from the mother or the child or the, the dolphins having friends and, you know, they've made friends and all of a sudden they're gone in their life? Have you looked into the entity of that? Well, I can tell you just from our observations, yeah, they were very distressed. They were discombobulated. They really weren't doing their normal behavior. You know, they were just traveling a lot and trying to figure out who's who. Um, we don't like do any blood work to measure cortisol levels or anything like that. Um, but you know, there are studies from the tuna, tuna net problem with dolphins that have taken samples from animals who have been caught in nets or separated and looked at their blood and their stress levels and it's huge. I mean, of course, you know, they're fighting for their lives. Um, anxiety, yeah, it's a hard thing to measure, I guess, with a wild dolphin, but. Have you found therapies or treatments or something to come forward on to help with that in the future? Um, oh, yeah, therapies, I haven't. Um, you know, I imagine there are some facilities when they take stranded animals <coughs> that are in some kind of stress that they, you know, try to socialize them with their other animals or a trainer. Yeah, that's probably all you can do for a um, stressed animal. You know, I'll just tell you briefly, um, after the uh, oil catastrophe in the Gulf, 
um, and thousands, I don't even want to tell you how many thousands of dolphins probably died, but I got a call from SeaWorld in Orlando that there was a spotted dolphin. Could I come up and look at her? And I think, yeah. Whew. I went up there, and it was the saddest thing I had ever seen. It was a lone dolphin in a pool, which sucks, but, you know, normally. But she was so um, traumatized or neurologically poisoned, I guess, all of that. She would just hang in the corner of the pool. I was trying to record her sounds and see what I could observe. And she was hardly moving. She was just lethargic. You know, it could have been partly the oil and partly just the trauma of probably seeing her relatives die or go on fire. Who knows? I mean, I heard horror stories from a lot of people. So, yeah, they're mammals. They're social mammals. They're going to be traumatized. You know, what you do for them. Um, you know, the sanctuaries that are emerging for dolphins, like there are elephant sanctuaries and other animal sanctuaries, they have very specific protocols to try to socialize them if they've been, you know, captive for a long time or traumatized or mother's been killed or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, it's not unlike human therapy probably in some ways as far as providing relief and comfort and whatever that means. But, yeah, good question. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you all. That was quick, correct. I mentioned anything. What did people that run down the talk show? But what? Don't you like this? after afterwards, the people go. Outside. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah. I know. Okay. So the, the, before you leave, I just wanted to mention that um, uh, next, the next first Wednesday is going to be. I don't know what the exact title is, but I know the content. Uh, it's it's basically about floods and drought and, and how California can manage its water better, particularly because with climate change, much like everything else, both of those are becoming more severe. And it's by uh, a woman who leads a California-based conservation organization that sort of specializes on, on water. She's uh, very good. And on this, for, for this, when you come down um, afterwards, if you go outside here, as I said, there's cocktails, art, and conversation, and it's a chance to, you know, talk more to the speaker, talk to each other, and, and trade ideas. The whole point of these is to have more ex extended discussions. And I will say, um, that's just a terrific talk. In an, I have a, a passion. I study, I like wolves. But I could see if, if I didn't like wolves, it would be dolphins. <laughs> <laughs> Except You're wolves are, are monogamous for life. That's all I <laughs> Can't have everything. Thank you very much.